Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Fortune's senior editor at large, Brian Dumain. Very pleased to have today as my guest um, Peter Voser. Uh, and we're going to easily talk over the Vuvuzelas today uh, in the background and, uh, and discuss climate change and the implications of it globally. Um, Peter and I are going to have a discussion for about 10 minutes and then we're going to bring out our other panelists and have a, a broader discussion on climate change. Peter's the CEO of uh, Shell, uh, which is the, uh, according to Fortune Magazine's uh, Global 500 rankings, the, uh, not only the largest oil company in the world, but the largest company in the world. Uh, 101,000 uh, employees, uh, operates in 90 countries, and revenues last year, I believe, $278 billion with a B. Now, in terms of energy, the, the big story is the spill in the Gulf. Uh, Peter, what lessons are there to be learned uh, from the spill in the Gulf other than it's good not to be the CEO of BP? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess no comments on that one. But um, no, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, it's obviously a, a very tragic event for the families, actually, because we tend to forget that actually 11 uh, persons lost their life, and obviously also for the, the whole Gulf states and, and the environment. Um, it's clear after now some of the findings are coming out uh, that the oil response side uh, has got some weaknesses and we as an industry we have to come together in order to actually um, be better prepared in the future to actually deal with, with uh, spills. Um, that we can actually prevent these things is obviously also on our agenda. Now there we need to find the root causes of the, <clears throat> of the, the leak itself, of the blowout. What we have seen so far, I think from a shell point of view, we would not have drilled this well in the same way. We have got other safety procedures um, across, across the globe. But I think, again, for some companies there will be some learning in this as well, which needs to be adapted. So I think we are looking at, like Shell, at global standards which we keep and most probably we'll see some movements around that as well. So you think your technology is different enough from BP's that we shouldn't have to worry about similar spills in the future, like the BP spill was more of a, uh, a cutting corners on the part of BP? Yeah, see, to say you shouldn't worry about it is, is the wrong thing in our industry because things mm -hmm. do, do happen. But I think the safety procedures, the design procedures you have, they have to be constantly improved. And we have, for example, started in 2007. Uh, by that time, we actually decided to go more into ultra-deep water. We have actually revamped all of our designs and our safety procedures. And I think by, by doing so, you can actually prevent uh, these kind of things happening much more and I think that's where we need to, to drive it even further on a global scale. Now we do use global standards irrespective of local legislation so then we are normally higher and if I look at what um, Salazar now is proposing to change in terms of regulations in the United States I can say this is pretty much in line with our global standard yeah. already. Do you expect deep water drilling uh to continue and to be a major part of your portfolio, or is the BP spill going to uh, slow that process down or maybe even stop it going forward? Yeah, my, my, our expectation is it is going to continue, and this is really based on our belief that the energy system uh, going forward over the next few decades will actually need all the energy uh, being uh, needs to be developed, being it either fossil um, resources, being it nuclear, renewables, etc. Because given the rise in the population and the rise in the developing world of energy needs, mm -hmm. we will have to um, develop those resources in, in, in deep waters as well. Okay. So my expectation is that we will go forward with it, but it will need some changes. Okay. Yeah, I want to get back in a moment to uh, the global outlook for energy, but uh, just briefly before that, yesterday at the conference, uh, Mo Ibrahim uh, raised Nigeria and the pollution in the Niger Delta there um, and called out Shell as, as 
contributing to the uh, situation. What, what do you think is going on there uh, with the pollution in the Niger Delta? What, what is the cause and uh, what, what could be done about it? Yeah. Nigeria is a very complex situation, but I think if you kind of peel the onion, it comes down to poverty, lack of jobs, uh, social services and corruption. Uh, that we see actually um, the country struggling to actually make uh, best use of its revenue flows. Now I think as an oil and gas company like Shell, we can contribute uh, in the best way actually by doing our job properly, i.e. means we generate revenues for the government so that they actually can distribute it across the world. Now that has been quite um, problematic over the last few years because of uh, sabotage, theft, and, and violence. So for example, on the spill side, if I just take 2009, 98% of our spills in the Niger Delta were actually uh, caused by sabotage and or theft. Now, by a Nigerian law, we have the obligation to clean it up, irrespective of the cause, which we do. But I can only do this if our staff are actually allowed to go into these areas and they're actually secure because I will not send people in if, they, if they're right. under threat in that sense. What, what does it say about the, the economic situation in Nigeria that there are these saboteurs? And what, why aren't they being enriched by the oil in the region? What, what's keeping that from happening? Shell has, over the last five years, for example, delivered $39 billion to the central government. Uh, in terms of revenues, in terms of, um, let's say, royalties and taxes. And they're also direct majority shareholders, so they have much more actually coming in. Mm -hmm. Now, these funds are most probably not used in the best way across uh, the, the Niger Delta in order mm -hmm. to actually increase, let's say, the living standards, give jobs and work. Now, as Shell, we try to do as much as possible. We have a very high local content. So when we actually use materials or uh, engineering jobs, we do it in Nigeria. But we cannot be stepping into the shoes of the government. We can deliver the revenues so that these can be done. Mm -hmm. Now we do a lot of social projects as well um, out of our uh, uh, local company. Uh, but there is a limit to how much you can do there. So I think this is a stakeholder issue where the government, the oil and gas companies, uh, the, the local people from the Delta and others need to work together in order to actually improve long-term um, living standards. I mean, if you look at the current oil price, if you have uh, theft of crude oil, these are rich uh, people by now because <laughs> you, you can get a lot of, of money. Right. Now, they are transformed into arms, uh, into uh, ammunition, and that causes us actually quite a bit of problems on the sabotage side. But I have to say the Nigerian government, through their amnesty program, is making some good steps forward. Mm -hmm. It's a fragile um, amnesty arrangement still, but let's hope that in the longer term we can keep, keep it going so that we can actually increase production again, mm -hmm. which means more revenues for the government, which means more revenues for the Delta states as well. So this is a kind of a vicious circle which we need to break through. Okay, good. Uh, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the full session to uh, ask Peter some questions about either you know, the BP spill or, or the Niger Delta, if, if any of you wish. But I want to get to the, uh, the big picture with climate change and, and um, fossil fuels. Where, where are we in terms of uh, oil and natural gas? I mean, we hear a lot of talk about uh, peak oil and uh, the scarcities. Uh, are we to expect a world in which the price of oil is going to uh, rise dramatically? Yeah, the word dramatically I never like too much, but I think, <laughs> as I said beforehand, we need all the energy sources to be developed. Um, I think once we get the price for carbon as well, um, we have to go to always uh, more difficult areas. Um, uh, the, therefore, costs will go up to find oil and gas, and hence I think overall the oil and the gas price will actually go up. But let me also say one thing, we talk a lot about the supply side, and we can deliver a lot through new technologies, like we, have just, we are delivering more gas to the world. We have now 250 years of current consumption of gas. We have uh, resources now. We don't talk too much about energy efficiency. 
-hmm. which is the demand side of the whole thing, which is not always very popular. So you drive less, you have smaller cars, you isolate your houses better, etc. That's, I think, where all the stakeholders are actually um, asked to, to uh, deliver to this as well, that through energy efficiency we can actually um, uh, a lot of, uh, we can save a lot of, uh, of energy and hence we can actually combat climate change much better. So to, to sum up here, and our, our time is uh, just about up, uh, so if there's a combination of maybe moving more towards natural gas, uh, uh, putting in place efficiency standards, and then slowly bringing renewables such as solar and wind into play, you think in the long term we might be able to meet that 80% reduction goal of uh, CO2 by 2050? I think we need to start now yeah. to deliver things which we can deliver today. There's a lot of things which we have had on our table which we actually can deliver. We need certainty on the long-term pricing of, of carbon, but we also, I think, we need um, uh, as I said, everybody needs to work together. But let's also be clear on the timing side. We know historically it takes a few decades, normally 30 years, before you, with a new technology, before you can capture 1% of the energy system in the world, the energy global market. It's a complex system, the energy system. So wind is just by 2015 going to get to 1%. Biofuels is about there now, mm -hmm. so we should also be clear, this is not about generating a new mo mobile phone which has a lifespan of three months. Mm -hmm. This is about generating energy for 40, 50 years, and this needs a development phase. And let's also be clear that some of the renewables, they will also use scarce resources like lithium, like neodymium, etc. Mm -hmm. And we need to be careful that we are not generating another problem by right. actually going too fast into it. We need right. to develop the technology and make it affordable. Today, it is still too expensive. Right. Okay, so a big challenge, but doable. Uh, we're gonna call our other panelists up. In the meantime, let's give a round of applause to Peter Voser. Thank you.